In my video on the basic credibility of competing theories, I made an obtuse reference to a mathematical error made by a prominent mythicist, and I've been asked to explain this. The mythicist is Richard Carrier. He makes his case for mythicism in two books. In Proving History, he sets out a method by which evidence will be sought and applied to a mathematical decision-making model, the output of which is a probability that Jesus was a historical figure. Carrier employs Bayes' theorem. Bayes' theorem is a key result in basic probability theory and it's widely used in probability and statistics. It's about conditional probability, when the probability of a random event A occurring is conditional on whether another random event B has also occurred. It is stated as this formula. In words it means the probability of A given B is equal to the probability of B given A times the probability of A without reference to B all divided by the probability of B without reference to A. As an example, an exam has a pass rate of 40%. A college offers an optional preparatory course. 1,000 people take the exam, of which 200 took the course. As expected, 400 pass, of which 100 took the course. What is the probability of passing the exam given that you have taken the course? The obvious answer is 50%. We can also use Bayes' theorem. So the probability of passing the exam given that you took the course is equal to the probability of taking the course given that you passed the exam, which is 0.25, times the probability of passing the exam, which is 0.4, all divided by the probability of taking the course, which is 0.2. So in this case, Bayes' theorem gets the right result, but it's rather a roundabout way of doing it. Here's a more realistic example. We have a test to see if someone with a headache has meningitis. This test will be positive in 99.5% of people with meningitis, and it will be positive in half a percent of people who do not have meningitis. We also know that one in a thousand people with headache have meningitis. That being so, if somebody tests positive, what is the probability that they have meningitis? So the probability of having meningitis, given that the test is positive, is equal to the probability of testing positive, given that they have meningitis, times the probability of having meningitis, all over the probability of testing positive. The probability of testing positive is equal to the probability of having meningitis and testing positive, plus the probability of not having meningitis and testing positive. This is what it comes out at. Surprising, perhaps? Carrier's formulation of the historicity question then is the probability that Jesus existed, given the evidence we have, is equal to the probability of finding the evidence we have given that he existed times the probability that he existed divided by the probability of finding the evidence we have whether or not he existed, which of course equals 1 as we have the evidence that we have. Carrier actually used the odds form of Bayes' theorem, which is exactly equivalent, but is rather more confusing. This is a perfectly correct application of Bayes' theorem, but it is rather a roundabout way of calculating the probabilities, and it is rather obscure, especially to his audience who are primarily scholars of the New Testament and ancient history, and so are not generally familiar with probability theory. The complexity of Bayes' theorem does therefore rather obscure the message. It is not, however, incorrect. The error he makes is a much more fundamental one. Carrier does not classify the issue into specific arguments as I have done, but rather into bodies of evidence, calculating probabilities separately for evidence from the Acts of the Apostles, the Epistles, the Gospels and the extra-biblical record. He also bases his argument for the prior probability that is, the probability that Jesus existed without reference to these bodies of evidence, on the rank Raglan hero class, which if you follow the mythicism versus historicity debate, you will certainly come across. Again, not an incorrect approach, but rather a convoluted one. His error, however, is in using what are called geometric probability combinations,
In other words, multiplying probabilities together rather than adding them up. Basic probability theory, concerned with things like rolling dice and drawing cards, uses these geometric combinations. So that, for example, the chance of rolling two sixes is 1 over 6 times 1 over 6, or 1 over 36. The chance of drawing two hearts from a deck of cards is 13 over 52 times 12 over 51, etc. The problem is that basic probability courses often gloss over a hard assumption that must be met if geometric probability combinations are to be reasonable, and that assumption is that the probabilities being combined are strictly independent of each other. And in the case of Jesus, they clearly aren't independent of each other. Acts was written by the same author as one of the Gospels. The Epistles may be independent of the Gospels as they were written before them, but the Gospels cannot be said to be independent of the Epistles. Neither can the Biblical and extra-Biblical records be said to be independent of each other. All groups of evidence were derived ultimately from a similar time and from the same or similar religious groups. The alternative to geometric probability combinations is arithmetic in which probabilities are added up and weighed. Though strictly, independence is also an assumption for models that use arithmetic probability combinations, it's a much softer one. The reason being that the individual probabilities have a far lower overall impact on the final result than they do with geometric combinations. In the UK, the best-known illustration of this error concerns the case of Roy Meadow. Meadow was a paediatrician who gave evidence in several trials of cot death cases, including that of Sally Clark, a lawyer who had two children die from cot death. Meadow calculated that the odds of this happening by natural causes was 73 million to one, or one in a hundred years in England and Wales. He arrived at this figure by squaring the cot death rate in her socio-economic group, which was 1 in 8,500 live births. He probably did not realise that he was making the assumption in this calculation that cot death does not run in families. This was a foolish assumption, given that very few diseases do not run in families, even though at the time the evidence of cot death running in families was limited. In fact, Cot death does run in families, and his error put his calculation out by a factor of at least 100. This means that at least one family a year will be affected by a second cot death from natural causes. As any such cases are liable to end up in court, natural causes was the most probable explanation. Sally Clark was innocent and ultimately died as a consequence of the stresses she had endured. This case, in which an innocent mother already grieving two children was sent to prison, left a lasting stain on the British legal system. Anyway, returning to Jesus. Using geometric combinations of probabilities from his evidence groups, Carrier calculated upper and lower bounds of probability. They were that the probability that Jesus existed is between 32% and 0.008%. I have recalculated Carrier's probabilities arithmetically. There are different ways of doing this by using different weightings, for example, but I have simply weighted his groups equally. My arithmetic calculation gives an upper bound probability of historicity of 46% and a lower bound of 18%. This seems not an unreasonable result, but caution is necessary. Carrier's assessment of the probabilities of the various evidence groups was essentially arbitrary. He estimated these probabilities in the knowledge that the results would be used in his geometric model. He knew what the results of his model would be, but did not know the error he had made and was therefore minded to be generous towards historicity in the light of what his model produced. Had he been using an arithmetic model, he would no doubt have been more circumspect his argument is based on the idea of being very reasonable towards the historicist viewpoint and then demonstrating that even being reasonable it still does not hold up and this argument is utterly fallacious. It should be obvious that when we examine an issue like historicity versus mythicism we weigh evidence for one side or the other 
as happens in court and as we do for countless decisions in our lives. Weighing is an inherently arithmetic process in which weights are added or subtracted but not multiplied or divided. I have no desire to dismiss Carrier's work. Within the field of his expertise, that being New Testament and ancient historical scholarship, he makes a fair argument. But he really ought to fix his mathematics to make it both fairer and more accessible.